when you conduct a magic show, an important element is who you invite on stage to do the trick with you. This is so important that there are books written about this, telling the performer what to look for so you could invite the right person on stage to join you in the effect or the illusion. And for the performer, this is important because if you do not pick the right person, your individual trick, possibly your entire magic show, could be completely ruined. Now, in our gospel reading, Jesus, he's teaching in the synagogue, and he invites a woman forward. And in the eyes of everybody there, he invites the wrong person. She should not be coming up to the front. But of course, Jesus is not interested in just putting on a show or conducting a service. Rather, Jesus enters the community, and he is interested in making it a place of life and healing. So as we go through, I want you to think of two questions. Two questions should be in your mind. What is the freedom that Jesus is calling you into? And secondly, as a community, what is the community that Jesus is calling us to be? I invite you to pick up your Bibles and turn to the Gospel of Luke. We're in chapter 13, and we start at verse 10. Jesus is teaching in a synagogue, and he's the guest preacher, if you will. Right? So this would have been a standard practice. Jesus was a rabbi, and he traveled around a lot, and he was well known. So he would have been invited by the ruler of the synagogue to come and teach. And this probably was a fairly uh, constant occurrence in Jesus' life and ministry. Now this synagogue, they would have had their own practices, and they would have had their own liturgies, much like we do here, there would have been a flow to the service. And at one point, Jesus would have gotten up to teach. Well, in actuality, he would have sat down to preach because that's how they preached in the synagogues. So picture in your mind Jesus sitting there preaching to this congregation gathered before him. And all of a sudden, he stops because he sees a woman. Maybe she's at the back. Maybe she's trying to blend in, trying not to be noticed. But Jesus knows her situation. She has slipped into the service. She is filled with pain and struggle. She's described as being bent over and could not fully straighten herself. She has had a disabling spirit for 18 years. Now, interestingly, in the culture of that day, Within that synagogue, she should not have been there. The synagogue was for people who were whole. There was this general understanding that to suffer, particularly under any physical ailment, such as this, like not a flu, nothing, but anything extreme, like being bent over for 18 years, that this was a sign that God was angry with you. Right? You were being punished because of some sin in your life. So, and to be on God's bad side was to be cut out of the worship life of the community. You just couldn't go, right? Because you, were, would, you would be seen as, in some sense, spiritually unclean, and therefore, you would be tainting the righteousness of everybody around you. Jesus sees her, and he calls her forward. And I am sure that at this point, everybody thinks that Jesus is going to scold her. Jesus is going to say something like, What on earth are you doing in this place? Crippled over as you are. Don't you know that God is judging you? Don't you know that you don't belong? Don't you know that you are ruining the holiness of everybody around you? You should just get out. That's what they think Jesus is going to say. Except he doesn't. Jesus looks at her with heart filled with grace and eyes filled with love. And he says to her, woman, you are freed from your disability. And he touches her. He places his hand on someone for whom the entire place would not touch. And the healing love of Jesus flows into her life 
and into her body. Imagine if the woman believed that she should not be in the presence of Jesus, that she could not go there, that God was in fact angry at her, and she was in fact being punished. Imagine if she thought, for whatever reason, I don't belong. I can't be a part of the church. Imagine if she stayed away. What would she have missed? Sometimes we think that if we have something we are struggling with, that we don't belong to the community of faith, that we need to, to stay away. I hear so often people who say to me, you know, I have questions uh, or doubts even about this whole thing, and so I can't go to church right now. But that makes it sound like the church is the place that you go once you have figured it out. Or, you know, they say, well, if I go to church, then I'm going to slink into the background and maybe hide behind a pillar so that uh, nobody, even God, can't see that I'm there. Or I'll go and I'll just pretend that everything is okay, but, in, but deep inside, I'm struggling. Jesus knows the deal. There was a lot of people in that synagogue, but Jesus zeroes into her. And in fact, he calls her forward to experience his love and his power in a deep fashion. Where might Jesus be calling you to come forward? I just recently read um, about a study that George Barna did. I think he did it in 2010, where he study, he studies churches. Um, and he said that, and I can't remember the entire uh, number, but it must, I think it was over around 70%. 70% of people who go to church on a regular basis do not believe that they will enter the presence of God. They just don't believe that God's going to show up in the church. They don't believe when they sit in the church, when they sit in the pews, that Jesus is there. What if he is? Where might Jesus be calling you to come forward? Where might he be calling you to come to him to bear your needs and your struggles and whatever disabling spirit that you carry around with you? What freedom, what life, what joy is Christ just waiting to call you into? What if you could choose right now to open yourself and to hear that calling. Because the reality is that this is God's vision for you. And this is the vision for what God wants in the community. If we believe, and we do, that Christ is present in the midst of the community, then we must say that this is the type of community that Jesus longs for. Because the other side of our reading is that Jesus completely and totally annoys the people in charge of the service. Can you understand? Can you get that? They had spent a lot of time organizing this thing, right? They had set up the scrolls. They had made sure the altar was all prepared. They had made sure the place was tidy. They had gotten all the volunteers organized. This was not only a spontaneous thing that Jesus did, but they saw this as completely inappropriate. What is this guest preacher doing? the ruler of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus healed on the Sabbath day, he said, there are six days which you ought to do work. Come on those days. The synagogue of the day. And you see this critique constantly uh, throughout Scripture, in the Old Testament and in the Gospels. It became more about rituals and structures than about the healing presence of God. Right? The synagogue was about the right people coming into the right building, the right way, doing the right things, saying the right things, and therefore maintaining their rightness. What is profound in this is that the ruler of the synagogue, who is completely annoyed, tries to make an argument based on the law. Right? He says the law says that the Sabbath, remember part of the Ten Commandments, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy, the Sabbath is a day which you should not do anything. And so Jesus, because you have done a work healing this woman, you have stepped outside of 
the law. Therefore, Jesus would have been seen as spiritually unclean, just as this woman was. So Jesus responds by the law. Doesn't each of you on the Sabbath day untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it to water to drink? Now that was lawfully allowed to do, right? Because that wasn't about work. That was about the preservation of life. And the preservation of life superseded all religious rules. So Jesus is saying that if you would so work toward the livelihood of your livestock, why not give yourself to the livelihood of your brothers and sisters? Ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, and hear this, Jesus is elevating her as equal to the ruler, ought not this woman be loosened from her bond on the Sabbath day? Jesus charges the ruler and therefore the entire community of completely missing the point with caring too much about forms and functions rather than people. Think about it. That community was a community that kept people out. It was a community that was not interested in helping or ministering to another, a community that was unable to accept the ministry of Jesus I'd ask you to keep two questions in mind. One was the individual question, where might Jesus be calling you into freedom? The other question was, what community are we called to be? Is that kind of, let's close the door to all in need, was that, is that that kind of community? I could easily make a joke here about Anglicans and light bulbs, right? But the truth is that all churches, regardless of denomination, sometimes struggle with this. Sometimes we begin to be so overly concerned with our structures and our forms that we forget that the gathering of the community is about gathering in the presence of Jesus. And when Jesus comes into the community, he comes to heal, he comes to give life, he comes to extend his grace to all people. I was away on educational leave this last week and one of the things that we talked about in class was a quote from Dallas Willard, who was an author and he said, your system is perfectly designed to get the results that you are seeing. Your system is perfectly designed to get the results that you are seeing. Right? On one hand, that's true. The system of the synagogue was designed to not allow healing to take place. It was always going to be the wrong time and the wrong person because the person in need couldn't actually come into the synagogue according to the rules. So imagine what was not occurring. If we were able to look into that life of that synagogue, imagine what we would not see. I'm sure we would not see a lot of healings. For 18 years, healings in this woman's life did not take place. Your system is perfectly designed to get the results that you are seeing. On one hand, that's true. But on the other hand, it's not. Why? Because of Jesus. Because when Jesus enters the system, he changes it. When Jesus enters the system, it becomes about him, not be about us. When Jesus enters the system, it becomes a mighty place of healing. and becomes a place of freedom. The question for us is, do we understand the spirit of Jesus in this place? To the point that we are willing to be challenged by his presence and to our center ourselves around his presence, both individually and corporately. Individually, could Jesus be calling you to healing? Could he be calling you forward? And I don't know of what, right? It might be a physical healing. It might be emotional. It might be spiritual. Scripture says that when the spirit, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Can we be bold enough to say the Spirit of the Lord is in this place? And he is holding out to me healing. He is holding out to me freedom. He is holding out to me joy. He is holding out to me forgiveness. And he calls me to himself to obtain it. And I can be bold enough to hear his voice calling me forward. As a community. It means that we need to be open to what Jesus does. 
Sometimes as communities, we can be afraid that Jesus will do something that we don't expect. You know, we've got to get used to that. Because life cannot be contained in trim lines. Jesus breathes life. Jesus gives healing. And the woman was made straight, and she lifted her hands, and she began to glorify God. And that was a testimony, not of how great she was, but the power of God in which they sat. It was a testimony to everybody here that Jesus was providing something for them, and all that they needed to do was open themselves up to receive it. All the people rejoiced at the glorious things that was done by Jesus. Can we not be that community, that community that Jesus calls us to be, a community united around Jesus, firm in his grace and living out his healing presence in this world? Because that is the community that Jesus calls us to be. We are called to rejoice and be glad in it. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit.